Hello and welcome to HIVRNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. Today we are plunging into, uh, well, a scientific pursuit that's been going on for decades, really, the hunt for a permanent cure for HIV. It's pretty staggering when you think about the time frame. 1983, that's when HIV was identified. Yeah. So yeah, four decades. It's four decades. And in that time, science has done incredible things, turning it from, you know, almost a certain death sentence into something manageable. Absolutely. A chronic condition. But the cure, like the cure, getting rid of it completely, that's still the big goal. The holy grail, you could say. And that's exactly what our sources are focused on today. There's this trial, the EBT-101 trial, run by a company called Excision Biotherapeutics. Right, and they're using CRISPR gene editing technology. It's a really uh, radical approach. They're totally radical. They're basically trying to use this genetic tool to rewrite the rule book inside the cells of someone living with HIV. So we need to unpack how this is supposed to work. And maybe why it's needed. I mean, why haven't the current drugs already solved this? Good point. Let's start there. The standard treatment now involves antiretroviral drugs, ARVs. And these drugs are honestly a modern miracle. They stop the virus from copying itself. Viral loads drop, often to undetectable levels. People can live long, pretty normal lives, which is amazing progress. Huge progress. But, and this is the crucial but, you have to take these drugs every single day, without fail, for life. And that's the catch, isn't it? Because the moment you stop those pills... The virus comes roaring back right. very quickly. And if it's not brought back under control, that eventually leads to AIDS. So the drugs work, but they don't eradicate. Why not? Where does the virus go? Well, that's the insidious part. HIV is what's called a retrovirus. It doesn't just float around. It actually inserts its entire genetic code, its blueprint, right into the DNA of our own immune cells. T-cells mainly. It writes itself into our own instruction manual. Exactly. And it creates these hidden copies, this sort of dermot cache of the virus. Scientists call it the latent reservoir. So these cells are like uh, sleeper agents, just sitting there, quiet as long as the drugs are present, but ready to wake up the second the coast is clear. That's a great way to put it. They're scattered throughout the body, waiting for the ARVs to disappear. Then, boom, they reactivate and start churning out new virus particles. So it's not just an infection anymore. It's literally become part of our genetic makeup in those cells. Corrupted code. Precisely. And this is where Professor Kamel Khalili, who was involved in starting excision, had this key insight. He described it like, all of a sudden, the cell finds oh my God, there's a segment incorporated and it's the whole viral gene. Wow, so once that viral gene is locked into our DNA. It changes the nature of the problem. Yeah. Clearly realized it becomes, in a way, like a genetic disease. Okay, I see. If the problem is now embedded in the DNA, a drug that just stops copying isn't enough. You need something that can edit the DNA itself. Right, you need a genetic tool. You need, well, a molecular editing system that can go in, find that specific chunk of viral DNA and literally cut it out. That was the aha moment then, shifting from antiviral drugs to genetic engineering. That's the core idea, yeah. And that's what led them straight to CRISPR. Okay, CRISPR, we hear a lot about it, developed back in 2012, right? But it wasn't exactly invented from scratch. No, not at all. It's actually borrowed from nature, from bacteria, believe it or not. Bacteria, how does that work? Well, bacteria have their own enemies, viruses called phages that infect them. CRISPR is basically part of the bacterial immune system. It uses these molecules to recognize the DNA of invading phages and chop it up. So its original job in the wild was literally zapping viruses. That's right. We've basically repurposed nature's own antiviral defense mechanism for human medicine. It's pretty clever. And the key is its precision, isn't it? We call it molecular scissors, but it's more complex than just cutting anywhere. Oh, definitely. It's really a two-part system. You have the scissors part, which is usually an enzyme called Cas9. That's what makes the physical cut in the DNA strands. But how does it know where to cut? That seems like the critical piece, especially when you're talking about the human genome. That's where the second part comes in. The guide RNA. This is a small piece of RNA that's designed, programmed essentially, to match the exact DNA sequence of the hidden HIV gene. So the guide RNA is like the GPS coordinate. It leads the Cas9 enzyme directly to the HIV code integrated into our DNA and says, cut here. Exactly. It provides the address. That programmability, the specificity, is what makes people think this approach might actually work for something like HIV. Okay, so the concept makes sense, but how unusual is this trial? Are lots of people using CRISPR for infections? 
Actually, no, it's quite rare. The sources mention this MIT technology review tally, looking at over 50 gene editing studies in humans. And most of those are for things like sickle cell disease, right? Inherited genetic conditions. Precisely. Only two out of more than 50 were targeting infectious diseases. So Excision's EBT-101 trial is definitely uh, charting new territory here. It's ambitious. But they must have had some reason to be optimistic. Did it work in earlier tests? Yes, that's key. They had encouraging results from the lab. First, they showed CRISPR could find and destroy HIV genes in isolated human cells. Okay, proof of concept in a dish. Right. Then they moved to mouse models. Mice infected with HIV were treated with this CRISPR system, delivered intravenously, so into their veins. Yes. And they saw what they called a functional <laughs> cure in nearly 40% of the treated mice. The virus was effectively cleared. 40% in mice? That's, well, that's pretty significant. That must be what gave them the confidence to try it in people. Absolutely. That kind of preclinical data is crucial. It suggests systemic delivery, getting the editor throughout the body is actually feasible. So moving to the EBT-101 trial in humans was the next logical, though very big, step. So let's get into the details of that human trial. Three people living with HIV enrolled initially. Yes, and they received the treatment as a single, one-time IV drip. Just one dose? How do they get the CRISPR machinery, the Cas9, and the guide RNA into the right cells all over the body with just one drip? Ah, that's the delivery challenge. You can't just inject the CRISPR proteins directly. They wouldn't get to the right place. You need a vehicle. Like a Trojan horse. Sort of, yeah. They use something called an adeno-associated virus, or AAV. It's a type of virus that's known to be harmless to humans, non-pathogenic. Okay, so it doesn't cause disease itself. Right. But it's naturally good at getting inside cells especially the kind of immune cells where HID likes to hide in that reservoir, so they modify this harmless AAV. How? They basically empty out the AAV's own genetic material and replace it with the DNA instructions for making the Cas9 enzyme and the specific guide RNA needed to target HIV. So the AAV acts like a tiny delivery capsule carrying the instructions. Exactly. Billions of these AAV capsules are in that 5V drip. They travel through the bloodstream, find the target cells, get inside, and then the cell's own machinery reads the instructions delivered by the AAV. And starts producing the CRISPR system, the scissors and the guide. Yes. And once produced inside the cell, that CRISPR system gets to work, searching for the integrated HIV DNA sequence using the guide RNA. And cutting it out. The command is basically find the hidden virus DNA and destroy it. That's the mission cut and destroy wherever it's hiding. Okay, but hold on. Using a virus, even a harmless one, to deliver instructions for DNA surgery throughout the entire body. That sounds incredibly risky. It is, absolutely. I mean, how can you be sure it only cuts the HIV DNA? What about off-target cuts? Snipping the wrong part of our own genome? That seems like a huge danger. That is the major safety concern. The risk of off-target edits is paramount. And it's why these trials start very cautiously with low doses and focus first and foremost on safety. So what did they find in these first three patients? Was it safe? Well, the initial report presented at a meeting in Brussels was positive on that front. At the dose level they used, the treatment appeared safe. Appeared safe, meaning no major side effects. Correct. No significant adverse events were reported in that first group, which is a big deal. It suggests the AAV delivery vector itself at this dose was well tolerated. That's a massive hurdle to clear. Okay, so step one, safety, looks promising, but that's only half the battle, isn't it? The real question is, did it actually work? Did it get rid of the virus? That's the million dollar question, or maybe billion dollar question in this field. And finding out requires this really critical step called analytical treatment interruption, or ATI. Analytical treatment interruption. Okay, what does that involve? Remember, these patients were already on their daily ARV pills, which kept the virus suppressed. So to see if the CRISPR treatment actually eliminated the hidden reservoir. You have to stop the regular drugs. Exactly. 12 weeks after they get the single CRISPR gene editing dose under very close medical supervision, their doctors stopped their ARV medication. Wow, that sounds nerve-wracking for the patients. You're deliberately taking away the safety net. It's a necessary risk to test for a cure. If CRISPR successfully destroyed enough of that hidden viral reservoir, the virus shouldn't rebound, or at least should be significantly delayed in rebounding after stopping the ARVs. And if the virus does come back quickly... Then it means the gene editing wasn't effective enough. Maybe it didn't reach enough cells, or maybe the dose wasn't high enough, or the reservoir was just too widespread. So do we know yet, for these first three people, 
did the virus rebound? And here's where it gets a bit frustrating. Excision presented the safety data, which is good, but they haven't released any early data about whether it actually worked. The efficacy results. They're holding it back. When are we supposed to find out? The full results for this initial group aren't expected until sometime in 2024. So there's a significant waiting period. Hmm. Why the wait if they have the data? Well, there's some commentary on this. Fyodor Ernoff, who's a big name in genome editing, he called the trial exceptionally ambitious and important. But he also noted it would be good to know sooner than later what the effect was. Even if there was no effect? Yes. He specifically said, including potentially no effect. From a purely scientific standpoint, knowing the outcome quickly is valuable. But the company is waiting until 2024. Is there another reason for the delay beyond just, you know, collecting all the final data points? Well, the sources do hint at the broader context here. It's a tough time financially for gene editing companies. The market is volatile. Ah, the financial angle. Yeah, these companies are under immense pressure from investors. They need big wins, clear, unambiguous positive results to boost confidence, and frankly, their stock prices. We've seen some struggles in the sector, haven't we? Beam Therapeutics had layoffs recently. Exactly. Beam laid off 20% of its staff. So there's this pressure cooker environment. And the sources suggest this might make companies especially cagey about releasing early results that might be ambiguous or not the home run they need. So waiting until 2024 might be partly strategic to package the results in the best possible light or perhaps wait until they have data from higher dose groups as well. It's certainly possible that the need for a strong, positive narrative for the financial markets is influencing the timing of the data release alongside the clinical timelines. Okay, so while we wait for the results from the first group, what are they doing next? Are they continuing? Oh yes, they're not backing down. The plan is to move forward with higher doses. The next phase involves enrolling six more patients. Higher doses of the AAV vector carrying the CRISPR instructions. That's right. Three patients will get a dose three times higher than the first group, and another three will get a dose ten times higher. Ten times higher. They're clearly banking on the idea that maybe a higher dose is needed to reach enough cells and make a real dent in that reservoir. It seems that way. They're doubling down on the core concept, believing this really could be a paradigm shift. It definitely feels like one. Using DNA surgery, essentially, to tackle an infectious disease that embeds itself in our code. That's the fundamental shift. We're moving beyond just managing the symptoms of replication and trying to fix the underlying genetic problem the virus creates. So, wrapping this up, even if the 2024 results aren't a perfect 100% cure for everyone straight away, what would still count as a success? Professor Khalili actually offered a really grounded perspective on this. He said that even if they don't get a complete cure right off the bat, yeah, even achieving a significant delay in the rebound of the virus after stopping ARVs would be a huge win, a major victory. Okay, so not necessarily instant cure, but proving the principle, showing that this approach can meaningfully impact the latent reservoir. Exactly. It would be like, you know, developing the very first drug in a completely new class. It might not be perfect, but it proves the concept works. It lays the foundation, sets the stage for second generation, third generation versions that could refine the delivery, improve the editing, and maybe eventually get to that cure. Precisely. It would validate the entire approach of using in vivo systemic gene editing to fight a persistent infection. It rewrites what we thought might be possible. It really does. And this trial, whatever happens in 2024, it forces you to think bigger, doesn't it? About treating infections, not just with drugs, but by actually permanently rewriting the corrupted code inside our own cells. It opens up fascinating possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here's something to think about. If CRISPR can potentially delete HIV from our DNA, what other viruses that use this trick of hiding in our genome might be next? Things like, say, herpes, or maybe certain strains of HPV, maybe even latent viruses linked to other chronic conditions. Could this approach fundamentally change how we treat them or even eliminate them entirely? The potential there is just, what's well, immense.